following interview was conducted with Richard Funkhauser for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, August 19, 2008 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Okay. Uh, I was born in Home Hospital in Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, my uh, uh, parents were Louis H. Funkhauser and Lara Gingrich Funkhauser. Uh, my mother's uh, father and her brothers uh, owned a group of grocery stores. At one time there were 10 in Lafayette and West Lafayette, uh, Gingrich Grocery Company. And she was the bookkeeper uh, until uh, she married my father. And uh, my uh, uh, father farmed uh, with, his, uh, with his father on what would be my great-great-grandfather's farm that he purchased in 1853 and moved from Pennsylvania in 1856. And they raised cattle and hogs, and uh, they were uh, into it in a big way. Uh, they had cattle and hogs that were shown at the county fairs, the Indiana State Fair, the International Livestock Exposition in Chicago. Uh, one of the boars uh, that they owned uh, eventually sold for $25,000 in 1922. <laughs> which <laughs> was unheard of. Was a bit, a bit of money. Uh, a couple of three years ago, they announced the world record for a boar was 85000 But if you look at 1922 dollars, that would be <laughs> much, 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 much more. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I grew up on this farm. And Where was the, the farm located? Oh, uh, it was located uh, uh, about five miles northeast of Delphi okay. uh, in Carroll County. Okay. And I grew up in a uh, house that my great great grandfather built. Uh, my paternal grandparents lived with us, and so uh, uh, I'll get into this later. But I met so many of the of the Whistler family members. My great great grandfather was a Whistler, and um, so I, I worked on the farm as a. a what was did you go to uh, grade school there in Delphi? Uh, yeah, I, I went to grade school at Delphi and high school, all in the same building, twelve years in the same building and uh, uh, graduated in 52, uh, went to, uh, the thought I wanted to be a social studies teacher, uh, went to uh, Indiana University, Bloomington, and uh, got a, a Bachelor of Science degree in education. Uh, did practice teaching, uh, but knew I did not want to be a teacher. Uh, a cousin uh, had told me when I uh, decided to become a social studies teacher, that uh, social studies teachers were a dime a dozen, and you needed a good minor to go with it. And so I had a, a minor in library science when I graduated with a bachelor's degree. How did and, you have decide to go to IU? But Purdue was uh, closer. Well, I wanted to be, I thought I wanted to be a teacher, and the other ones that I was considering were Ball State or Indiana State, but I thought, well, they only specialize in teaching, and if there was something other than teaching I wanted to go into, there would be more opportunities for uh, or other majors at IU than at Ball State or IS. Tell us what campus life was like. Any professors? Um, were you, you were in any activities when you were down there? Uh, no, not really. Not really. You lived on campus, though. Uh, freshman and sophomore years, I lived in the dorm. Uh, sophomore or junior, senior years, and graduate school lived out in town. Mm -hmm. There were three of us who, uh, four of us, uh, who moved from the dorms into a uh, into a house a house in town. Yeah. Oh, that sounds pretty nice. So, uh, uh, what was the campus like? What was the size of the campus? Not too large. I think there were about fifteen thousand students at, at IU okay. then. It was a much more, much nicer campus, more beautiful campus than Purdue mm -hmm. was even, even now. <laughs> it's more scenic. More scenic, yeah, yeah, yeah. The buildings were more diverse in architecture and all. Then after you finished, after you graduated, then you, did you do what was next? Yeah. Uh, well, then I was going to be subject to the draft, so I applied for a deferment, and uh, met uh, with a representative of the draft board, and said I was going to graduate school and would be asking for one of the deferment, and he asked me what I was majoring in, and I said library science, and he said, oh, there will be no problem because we have been instructed to defer scientists. And I said, well, thank you very much, and said nothing more. <laughs> and walked out. <laughs> and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Well, then graduate professional education, what was, did that come next then? You went to library school? Yeah, I, I uh, went immediately to library school uh, and uh, uh, got my degree a year later in, uh, uh, well, in June of 1957. Uh, had never had never worked in a library. Didn't never never worked the first bit in a library. And uh, comparing now, uh, I don't know. If, I'm not sure I'd be qualified to be a shelter in the Purdue libraries now. <laughs> it's a challenge. Yeah, but I uh, I, I wrote a, I was expected to be then subject to the draft, and I wrote to Mr. Moriarty, uh, asking if there were any summer job opportunities in the library, and he wrote back saying come in for an interview, and uh, I met with him. I think he even suggested coming in on a Saturday so I wouldn't miss class. And uh, we had a, I don't know, a talk for 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes maybe, and, he, and he's like, well, okay, come back uh, in a month, two months, whenever you graduate, and we'll have a job for you. He says, I don't know where it'll be, but there'll be a job for you. And uh, I came back after graduation, in fact, the day after graduation, started work at, at Purdue, very, very traitorous, moving from IU to Purdue. And uh, uh, what he, year would this have been? This would have been 57, June of 1957. And I went to his office and he said, uh, okay, come on with me. Uh, this was the old building before Stort Center opened and all. Stort Center was being built around the old library building at that time. We walked down to the reference room, which is now the special collections room. And uh, he uh, introduced me to Keith and said, here's your new, Keith Dowden, and he said, here's your new reference assistant. I had never met Keith Dowden before in my life. And uh, there were no uh, Describe passing, what the no, room looked like. Uh, well, I, I said there, there were no uh, uh, no big interviews of everybody passing you off from one person to another. Uh, when I uh, was appointed engineering librarian, there were no presentations to to uh, to the faculty. You know, uh, it's a, it was a much simpler, much easier time to, to get a job then, uh, uh, as far as interviewing went. went. Uh, the old reference room. Uh, uh, I started in the summer, and it was hot in there. Uh, they are very, uh, there used to be windows on three sides of it uh, that you could open and get breeze through it, but because Stuart Center was being built, only one side had any, any windows you could open. And they had these, there were these tall fans that were seven or eight feet high, and uh, fan blades maybe three feet in circumference, blowing air uh, through it and all. Uh, and, uh, uh, but there were the bookshelves lining the walls and tables. It was the main study room uh, then for the, uh, for the students. There had been the, it's called the Library Annex, which was a temporary building uh, that was built to the north of the, or to, to the west of the old library building, but it had been torn down uh, then to make way for, uh, uh, for the addition of, for the building of Stuart Center. And so in addition to answering reference questions, I took care of the maps and the uh, uh, publications of the various Atomic Energy Commission labs. Uh, the maps were kept in uh, what is now the, uh, uh, I think what they call it, career opportunities, the job placement, the job placement where the, where the offices are. And across the hall where the interview rooms are now uh, was the serials, uh, current journals were displayed there. And there were study tables in the center, same way with the, the maps were arranged, cases were arranged around the outside wall, and there were study places in the center. Interesting. Yeah. What, was the, what was housing like? What was the campus like when you came? Was housing hard, hard to find? or? Well, I, I lived up at Delphi on the farm. Oh, you can. Oh, you can. So I commuted. Oh, okay. So I, I had no. Sure. Uh, okay. no, no, no what was problem. the size of the library staff? Not, not too large. No, not too large. Were time. there other li satellite, when I, I'm using the term satellite libraries in addition, when you came? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, most of them, most of them were, uh, there was uh, physics and chemistry and math and pharmacy and, well it was called the Agricultural Experiment Station Library, and then Biology Library, the latter two were combined into the Life Sciences Library. Mm -hmm. Then there were other smaller, there was a poultry library, um, uh, quite, quite a few there was other. No there, there was, there was no, man, no, there was no a, management. Uh, hmm? No management. No, ma no management. That didn't start until uh, about 1962 or something like that when okay. the school was established. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
So Bernice, Bernice Dutton, oh no, Teddy Andrews was in pharmacy at that time. Pharmacy, she had succeeded yeah. Bernice Dutton sure. just a shortly before. Uh, Harry Kuntz was in physics. Um, uh, I forgot the name of the chemistry librarian. Uh, uh, Henry uh, was, in, was in ag library. Uh, I'll remember his name pretty soon. Right, right. Uh, he answered that. Yeah, and uh, um, uh, uh, Becky, I think Rebecca, Be oh no, uh, yeah, Becky uh, Taggart may have been out at the airport, the aviation technology, oh, there was or the, library. the aero, the aero library, was aeronautical out there, aero. engineering library okay. out at the airport. Okay. Yeah. Then, then you moved on to engineering. Like well, the, like then I, I worked for eight months or so. Uh, in the reference department and then uh, joined the reserves so I didn't have to go for two years to the draft and when I when I left uh, for the for the military duty uh, Mr. Moriarty said well the engineering librarian's position will be open for you uh, open when you get back and I expect to appoint you to that position and uh, I had no experience with engineering and I was really surprised I came back and yeah uh, I was uh, I, I was engineering library uh, then many many years where, later and tell, tell for the researchers where that building where were you oh, there were there was no there was no one building uh, there were several libraries mechanical electrical civil engineering uh, sciences um, and a couple more small small libraries. Each of the schools had a library. The departments, the yeah. Each of the schools of engineering okay. had there. Then later, nuclear engineering was was added added to the group. But uh, I was appointed the engineering librarian, and then many many years later, uh, Malik Morlock, who was coordinator of regional campuses, libraries at that time, uh, said she came to interview for the uh, regional campuses coordinator position became aware that the engineering library position had, was open and asked to apply for it. Uh, she had a master's degree in physics. Uh, she had worked on the Manhattan Project at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, she was at that time engineering librarian at I believe the University of Missouri and uh, was told by Mr. Moriarty that uh, that position was not available for interviewing. And later on, she found out why she was not considered because there, the previous engineering librarian here at Purdue was a woman and they, the men in the engineering schools could not get along with her. And Moriarty decided that he would never, he would not appoint a woman again. <laughs> Interesting sidelight there. Interesting. Yeah, right, okay. Now let's talk a little bit, uh, you were there, but then shortly the next thing I guess will be con the contour project. Well, could, could I go go back Sorry, one yeah, thing Re yeah. regarding regarding women here? Okay. Um, at that at that time when I came, um, married uh, married women were not hired in faculty positions. Uh, University wide. In the libraries, oh. in the libraries, in faculty positions, they were given junior professional positions. Uh, divorced women, single women, uh, would be hired in 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 faculty positions. Uh, his, uh, his, the idea was, I guess, that uh, you would be more uh, uh, concerned about your job. You would do your job better if you weren't married and had a husband and children that you had to uh, al also uh, work with and all. And um, in, uh, then Jean Lucas, uh, Jean Meadows, uh, single when she came, uh, uh, married. And she was, at, uh, at when she married at the time, she was the assistant engineering librarian reporting to me. And uh, uh, she uh, said she had been told by Mr. Moriarty that, well, it was okay for her to get married. She would be able to maintain her faculty position, but she might re receive decreased support funding for her travels and all. But she, no, she didn't, she found she did not. And that was pretty much the end of the, uh, of the, uh, Hiring for uh, uh, hiring only not uh, not hiring married women in faculty right. positions. Uh, for the researchers, what was the faculty status uh, for the librarians at that time? Was it the same as with the academics? Well, no. It was it was uh, you were professor of li then they called professor of libraries with the rank of, and uh, uh, it was we we pretty much had 
the equivalent of full faculty status, but it wasn't quite faculty status. We did not have representation on the university senate. Uh, we could, we did have sabbaticals, uh, pretty much all served on committees, faculty committees, and all that. Did. Uh, so it was almost faculty status, but not quite. And then in 1968, I believe it was, uh, the, as, as I understand it, the business office changed some code in, in a numbering, in job numberings uh, of cl job classes, which took away our faculty status. And uh, Mr. Moriarty uh, under, to, to talked with the faculty, do you want to fight for your faculty status? Do you want to get full faculty status? with all the responsibilities that it will entail, such as publishing, you know. Uh, because previously, uh, the, about the, your promotion was based on how good a job you did. And promotions were mostly based on the, uh, on, uh, the director of libraries making a recommendation to the, to the vice president, uh, head of academic services, head of academic affairs, uh, and, and you were promoted, you know. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, Quite different. Yeah, the faculty said yes, and there was a vote then by the university, by general vote, I think, by the university faculty uh, in 1969 uh, that we uh, be given full faculty status with all the responsibilities and entails. That. Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's very helpful for the researchers because there has been, for those people that are, have heard this, and so that's kind of a historical point. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about CAM for us? Well, could I talk more about the engineering library? Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. Please do. Uh, the, you had uh, a little bit of traveling then, didn't you? Yeah, the, yeah. I, I was, I was uh, between the libraries. I was out. I was Purdue's outdoor librarian between the campus, or between the libraries. And you know, if somebody couldn't reach me, and I said, "Well, did you try mechanical engineering?" Uh, yeah. Or no. Uh, yes, I did, and you weren't there. Did you try electrical engineering? No. Well, that's where I was. <laughs> <laughs> no cell phone. Yeah. Uh, so uh, regarding the engineering libraries, the responsibilities uh, mainly were just overseeing the operation of the of the individual libraries. Uh, there, they, each one of them had a clerical assistant, and uh, uh, so they might, may have been open at night or not. I'm not sure, but they were always closed on Saturday afternoons on home football games. They were they were at the library. Even the general library was open on all Saturdays, except they closed at noon on days of home football games. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, uh, the book selection was all done by a faculty representative or a committee in each of the individual engineering libraries. And those uh, representatives or committee members uh, really kept hands off the day-to-day -day operation of the library, except for one. Uh, who, who thought he had more responsibility for managing the library than, than he really had. And uh, he told the library assistant one day when she came in wearing red shoes that ladies did not wear red shoes and he did not want to see any, anybody and her wearing red shoes again. Uh, he also, uh, we, we made the library assistant and I made a change in policy which didn't really affect the <coughs> the people outside the lot, the users. He didn't like it, and he said, uh, "Why did you change this policy?" And says, "Well, Mr. Funkhauser and I decided to." Well, I don't like this policy. Change it back. And she says, "Well, I'll have to talk with Mr. Funkhauser." And he said, "Who who runs this library? Me, the representative, or Funkhauser?" She says, "He does." And <coughs> the professor called Esther Schlump, the head of public services at the time, and asked, "Who runs that library?" And Esther said that I did. And uh, he shortly thereafter resigned his position as, as represent, library representative. <laughs> Gracefully went out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Whenever, uh, oh, I, well, you were, going, you were going to go to Comcore, I think. Yeah, but that's, you know, that takes care of the engineering. <coughs> you want to go to Comcore? Uh, well, if I can have a moment here. <laughs> it's, oh, I, I must tell you two, two stories here, yeah. Okay. Um, a very, a very effective way to get books back that you, you need and a, and a library user will not return them. In those days? In those days. Well, it would still be an effective method today. Uh, Fritz Friedlander, who was a professor in electrical engineering, wanted a book back that was 
being held by a graduate student in double E, and the student wouldn't return it. And one day Fritz comes into the library and says, tell so-and-so that I have received a request for a recommendation for him from a prospective employer, and I am not going to reply to it until he returns the book. <laughs> Needless to say, the book came back very quickly. <laughs> he, he knew who had the book, in other words. He, he knew who had the book. Yeah, that was the old days. <laughs> I understand. <coughs> okay. Uh, Concord, you want to go to Yes, Concord? that would be fun. You got yeah. another story, though. Well, I think this comes, this, well, I'll, I'll tell it to you now. Yeah. Uh, in, um, in 1969, uh, I was up uh, in Chicago uh, on, a, on a Saturday or a weekday, stopped into the Chicago Public Library to see uh, Dorothy Kremen, who was a formerly, former chemistry librarian here at Purdue. And uh, she saw me and came over and says, you're leaving Purdue? And I said, no. She said, you've got a new job. I says, no. Why, why, why do you ask? He says, your job is advertised in the library journal. And I said, what? What do you mean? And she took, showed me the copy, and <coughs> lo and behold, there was my job. Uh, and I said, well, I don't know anything about this. And so on Monday, I stopped by Keith Dowden's office and asked him about it. And he says, oh, I guess we forgot to tell you. Uh, if you remember about a year ago, we asked if, if you were more interested in working with the science libraries or the engineering libraries, because at that time, I was working with the geology library and the math, I had the math library added to my responsibilities. And I said at that time that I uh, was more interested in working with the science libraries because they seemed to appreciate the library much more than the engineers did. And uh, he said, well, based on that, that answer, that's why we now advertise your job. And he says, but if you want to change your mind, it's OK. Yeah. I says, no, 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 that's, that's OK. <laughs> so just a little interesting thing. Yeah. So it reminds you of the old, the old one-liner. If you work for AT&T in the day you came in and their phone was not at your desk, that was it. Oh. <laughs> that was your last day. I never heard that one before. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, a little bit more about the uh, engineering libraries. This is bordering over into, G into science libraries, too. <coughs> but uh, there was also, I forgot to mention, the geology library which was a separate library, but it was a branch of the Civil Engineering Library uh, because the geologists were faculty members in the, in the School of Civil Engineering. But they had their own separate library in their facilities in the uh, ground floor, basement floor of the Kemen Met Building. So the official location in the card catalog uh, for the books in that library was was the stamps civil engineering, and then in, in, in pencil underneath and was Chem and Met, meaning the civil engineering library in Chem and Met, and that's the way it, it remained until geology got its own own library, and the books uh, books and journals and geological survey publications for the geology library were spread among uh, uh, several rooms in that in that their facility, including the department office. Uh, they were, I don't know, in, in bookcases up to nine feet high or so. You had to have a ladder to get them down. And, uh, oh, wow. and I, I, really, I really enjoyed working more with the geologists than I did with any other, any other group of the teaching faculty. And it was a lot much smaller. Those it days. was a lot much smaller, yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. There may have been only a half a dozen professors in geology, and so you knew them like all. a division. It really wasn't anything like what today, Earth and Atmospheric have yeah. really changed. And uh, Bill Melhorn, uh, professor there, was the uh, library library representative, and mm -hmm. he did the book selection, and he ha he helped organize the library. And uh, uh, at the time uh, when they got more space, the state geological survey publications were still in the general library, 
and we decided to transfer those over to the uh, to the geology library, and or should I say, civil engineering, Kevin Met, and um, they all came over okay, except Michigan. Uh, it seems the catalog location records got changed and everything, but the uh, boxes and boxes and boxes of the publications never showed up. We figured they emptied up, got somehow ended up in the trash. We just we don't we don't know. <laughs> they just never arrived. They never arrived. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you want to go on to uh, Concord? Yeah, that would be fine. Okay. Uh, there were uh, four, five, five uh, Indian institutes of technology established in India. Uh, with assistance, each one of them had assistance from a different uh, foreign government. Uh, the one at Kanpur uh, was the United States helped develop it. Uh, at Madras, there was the there were the Germans. At uh, Bombay were the Russians. At Karakpur, which is near Calcutta, uh, UNESCO, the uh, UN body, UNESCO helped develop it. And there was one in New Delhi. Uh, that was supported by the British. And so uh, for the American uh, uh, group, uh, there was, a, it was the U.S. Agency for International Development. USAID. USAID that, uh, that worked for it. Uh, they sent a survey team there about 1961, 1960 or 61, to determine what could be, what could be done. And uh, there were 10 universities that were eventually involved in this. They were all uh, noted science uh, engineering schools. And the 10 were, uh, were the uh, University of California at Berkeley, uh, Caltech at Pasadena, University of Illinois, uh, Purdue, uh, University of Michigan, Iowa State, Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, uh, Carnegie Mellon, in uh, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Princeton, and uh, MIT, uh, all noted uh, engineering science schools. So they, they, uh, <coughs> they gathered together. Uh, Purdue's uh, program there, support there, was unique in that Purdue was assigned the responsibility for one specific area of the development, and that was the library. Oliver Dunn, uh, the associate director of libraries at the time, uh, made a survey trip to uh, to Kanpur uh, to, to to see how the libraries might might uh, uh, assist in the development of a library there. And there was nothing. The the the, the IIT Kanpur as well as the all, of all the others were were started from scratch. There was absolutely nothing there. No campus. No books. No teacher. No faculty. No, nothing. <laughs> what about a building? There were no buildings. Uh, so they, it started out in temporary quarters. They, there was a uh, Harcourt Institute of Technology uh, in Kanpur, and they started out their first couple of years were a small number of students and faculty. But they quickly built a new campus uh, about uh, 10 miles outside of, outside of the city of Kanpur. But Oliver Dunn went there uh, uh, and uh, uh, came back with the proposal that uh, that li the Purdue libraries send a visit well they were called visiting professors consultant uh, from the Purdue libraries faculty to uh, the comp to Concord to the IIT Concord uh, to to work with the, um, the 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 faculty uh, the administration of IIT Concord to develop a, a, uh, a library. And these institutes, <coughs> at least Purdue, or at least IIT Comfort, it was to immediately develop a, a nationally recognized with India, within India and hopefully soon world recognized uh, research university uh, uh, in engineering and science. Uh, in, in fact, today, the uh, IIT Comfort 
as far as uh, science engineering schools goes, is the most distinguished one in, 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 the, in the India, in the whole country. You know. So um, we uh, uh, developed this program uh, to also uh, each of a, a copy of each book purchased by the engineering libraries, the physics, chemistry uh, libraries, uh, a duplicate copy would be purchased uh, at Purdue. It was cataloged at Purdue, given the same call number as the Purdue book was. Uh, catalog cards were made. The book was had the call number put on the spine, a pocket put in back. The catalog cards, completely ready for, for, for filing, were placed in the book pocket, and they were boxed and sent off to the to India. Uh, George Mellick <coughs> uh, was the first librarian who, who came from Purdue. He was the circulation librarian. And uh, he went uh, to Kanpur in the end, uh, at, uh, in the spring of 1962. And he had uh, his wife and five children accompanied him. Uh, the uh, the uh, visiting faculty from, from America uh, at Kanpur uh, most of them brought their families with them, even even their children and all. Um, so they they took off for for Kanpur, and they were there for for two years. And uh, at that time, uh, there began the, the the library at that time had, was just moving out to its new campus, and the library was in a a what what you might appear to be a workshop. Uh, or a warehouse with one of these sawtooth roofs. I know this isn't coming out on the <laughs> but uh, kind of a sawtooth roof, roof and uh, in those temporary quarters. And uh, shortly thereafter, work began on the design, uh, architectural designs for a new library building. And uh, Oliver worked on that uh, with the uh, architects Kanbindi and Rai in uh, New Delhi, who were the campus architects who developed this, this new campus. And uh, they had a, a, very, a very nice design. It was essentially two separate buildings. One building was four stories tall. The other building was only two stories high, but it sat on pillars matching up with the third and fourth floors of and the, the other, other structure. And so there were enclosed walkways uh, that connected these two two sections, and the uh, architects had put uh, two or three steps down. You go through the walkway, and then two or three more steps up into the other structure. And uh, Oliver pointed out that this just wasn't wouldn't work. Well, why not? Well, we do move book trucks between the two the two parts. So, oh yeah, well we hadn't thought of that. So <laughs> they became all <laughs> flat level. You could move. You could move book trucks. Uh, the library was uh, slightly relocated uh, because there was an interior courtyard uh, with a pond and uh, thing un, uh, it, within this between these two structures, and there was a tree, a large tree in the, that would have been torn down, but they decided to relocate the building a few feet in order to keep this tree and, and keep it in the center of the uh, of the uh, of the courtyard. And, uh, and I, I don't know about that tree, but there was another tree that, that was on the campus uh, that was, for some reason, was considered a sacred tree uh, by the uh, Hindu population. And because this had been village, there had been a village on the site before, and they had to leave, and the farmers had to sell their land to develop this and all. And uh, they were building a new lecture hall building. And uh, they had to cut the tree down, and there was great consternation about losing this tree, that bad things are going to happen. And sure enough, uh, uh, they were building the lecture hall. Uh, before it was constructed, one, uh, one wall collapsed on it. And they said, see, we told you something bad would happen uh, if you tore that tree down. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, that's, that's the way the library started. So uh, also, the Purdue libraries uh, purchased map runs of journals. Uh, for the uh, for the Kanpur Library, then uh, they started a uh, Kanpur, a management uh, program was started, and so 
copy, duplicate copies of books bought for the uh, Craner management program, not the ag economics section, but the, uh, the library, but the Craner management program. They eventually, they bought duplicate copies of those. So then I went in uh, 1964. Uh, Oliver, uh, George Mellick was there for two years. Uh, our time there overlapped about a month or so. And uh, I was very hesitant about uh, uh, going to going to Concord, and I received a very firm uh, statement that uh, from uh, Moriarty and Oliver Dunn that if I didn't like it, I could come back. And but I knew after just a couple of days there that, that I would like it. There would be no problem. Uh, I spent uh, about three weeks getting there, visiting Hawaii and. Japan, Hong Kong, Thailand, and arrived. And uh, uh, the first day, we spent about three days of orientation in New Delhi, and uh, then flew down to Kanpur. And uh, George and uh, his wife, met Helen, uh, met me at the airport. And uh, uh, for first thing we did was stop at a drugstore to get something called Enteroviaform, which was are supposed to be good in case you ate the wrong things. <laughs> and, and I must say, <coughs> in the two years that I was in India, I only missed a half a day of work. I was only, only ill a half a day. And I, I lay that to a, a very good cook who took good, good, good care of me. Uh, so I, I arrived in uh, uh, New Delhi, uh, or in Kanpur. Uh, Helen and George had already uh, hired a cook for me. And he was, he was very, very good. He had cooked for the British uh, for, for years. And, uh, spi Indian food was spicy, but he started me out in just a little bit and got spicier and spicier and spicier and all, so I could take the, just the hottest stuff. And uh, I arrived on a Saturday and Sunday, I thought I would, the, the, the camp, I must say, the campus was built as a residential campus where all the students and even the uh, faculty and staff and uh, everybody who worked at the at the institute was supposed to live on the campus, and so I had a. He said it was a townhouse, uh, living room, dining room, kitchen, uh, two bedrooms and two baths, a full western bath upstairs and an eastern bath downstairs, <laughs> and uh, uh, it was quite quite. And uh, it was all furnished. Yeah, it was all furnished. Yeah, all furnished. Uh huh. <coughs> And uh, the uh, second day I was there on a Sunday, I thought, well, I'll walk down to the, to the academic area and see what's going on. And so this would have been uh, about April, mid-April. And uh, uh, I, uh, I said, gee, it's pretty hot today. And then the next day I, I met the rest of the Americans. And I said, it was kind of warm yesterday, wasn't it? And I said, yeah, it was about 115 degrees. Uh, but it was very dry, so you really didn't, you didn't notice the heat that much. But then, uh, regarding the weather, uh, then the monsoon came, and the humidity was very high, but the temperature did drop to maybe only 100 degrees. <laughs> so that no was air, really... No air conditioning? Uh, I did have, we did have, air, I did have air conditioning in the, in the, uh, in the, where I lived, but not at work. They had these big uh, fans that during the very hot, dry weather. They, they dripped water down in front of them, so that would put cool air uh, out out onto you. So uh, uh, that that took uh, that took care of that. Who was responsible for the hiring? Did you hire Did you hire the people that worked in the library? No, 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 no. I was not responsible for it. What I was responsible for was essentially uh, coordinating the pro the uh, project with, with Purdue. It, it involved a lot of correspondence with Oliver Dunn. This was before electronic mail and all. So uh, about every, every, every two, every, well, this week I would write Oliver a letter. And then the next week I would get a reply from my letter of two weeks ago. And so we, about every, every week I was writing a letter or receiving a letter. Uh, from 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 him, and it was all. There were never any telephone conversations. No, no crises came up or anything, and uh, that's the way we. And made. you wanted to be sure that you were in charge to see that the books came and things of that sort. Right, and, and yeah, and also to look at uh, at how we might adapt American library techniques. 
uh, to the India, to an Indian library. Right. Uh, the library there was all open stacks. There was nothing except the reserve books. Those were the only things that were, were behind. I, I did visit a small college in, in Kanpur, and uh, uh, all the, uh, they said, well, the librarian is not here today. And uh, I, I noticed all of the books were in glass cases. And uh, they pointed out that, well, because the librarian was not there, they couldn't get any books because he was the only one who had the keys to, to all these cases of books. <laughs> Under lock and key. <laughs> Did you, you didn't come back at all during the two years you were no, here? No, no, no. But did you do some traveling? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I got uh, <coughs> all the way from, from uh, um, Oh, from, from the southern part of India in, into Kashmir, Kashmir in northern India, uh, where uh, uh, a lot of people uh, would go, uh, the Indians, uh, people uh, who could afford it, would go up there in the summertime. Because it's cool up there. Because it's, it's much cooler. In fact, uh, in fact, the people in Kashmir, which had a, a climate that might be like here, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they moved up to Gulmarg. Which was a little, which was a couple of three thousand feet higher in the summer because it was so hot in Kashmir, uh, or so hot in Srinagar, the the capital. But they, they moved to a cooler climate, you know. But had a had a wonderful time up there. The thing was to live on a houseboat, and uh, uh, there were four of us who went up, uh, and uh, we had a houseboat, and the houseboat had a living room, a dining room, three bedrooms, and three baths. This, this is a houseboat. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, that, so I, I was there for the two years, uh, traveled all over, uh, went down to the Indian Institute of Science, uh, which was founded by the Tata family, the wealthiest family in, uh, in India. Um, How far from uh, New Delhi was Kanpur? For the oh well, wow, yeah, yeah. That's that's a nice a nice story. It was about three hundred miles uh, to uh, to New Delhi. Uh, we usually uh, flew uh, in Indian Airlines up there, but sometimes we would drive, and it was very convenient because we would take our lunch with us. It took us pretty much, although it was only three hundred miles, it took us took you eight or nine hours to drive because there were no interstate highways. Mm -hmm. And the roads were pretty good, though, actually. Two-lane? Two-lane, yeah, two-lane. But, two but, but you would have to stop for a herd of goats or a herd of cattle crossing the road. Uh, you'd slow down when you went through the villages and all. But a little city of Agra happened to be about halfway to between Kanpur and New Delhi. And there was the Taj Mahal in Agra. And so we would take our lunch with us, and we would go into the into the... Uh, Taj Mahal grounds and spread out a blanket and have lunch and gaze at the Taj Mahal. <laughs> you lucked out. How great. That's really nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really so nice. I, I was there a few times. And uh, that, that was one of the, uh, as far as uh, one of the seeing first. things. Yeah. And uh, so, so I saw it quite a few times there. And just a little sideline on that uh, the greatest damage until now, the pollution. Uh, that has occurred at the Taj Mahal. Uh, it's, it's getting uh, eaten away now by pollution. But previous to that, the greatest damage done to the Taj Mahal was during World War II. Uh, not by action of war, but by the American soldiers who visited the place and dug out little colored stones out of the... Out of the uh, souvenirs. Mosaic. Yeah, yes, dug out for souvenirs. Uh, so, yeah. What did, now then, why did you come back? Did you know it was only for two years and then you had to oh, come yeah, back? Oh yeah, I knew it was Did for you have an option to, <coughs> well then who took your place? It, it was, it, you went there for two years and I was just ready to say that I would be willing to uh, stay for another two years, uh, but I never got the letter written uh, when I uh, heard from Oliver that they had selected a person to replace me, uh, Robert Kane, who worked in the uh, interinstitutional uh, oh, library, the, the, uh, uh, the regional campus coordinator of libraries at that time, it was called. And he, he followed me. He was there for a year and a half or two years. 
When did the project uh, finally end? Oh, yeah. well, well the, the project officially ended. It was a 10-year project. It officially started in 1962, ended in 1972. And others uh, that I can think of from Purdue who were there, it was not only the li li library faculty from Purdue that went, but also uh, Harvey Wilkie, who was in civil engineering, uh, Bill Pullen, who was in These geology. These are faculty members from yeah, Purdue. Yeah, visiting from Purdue, went to, went to Kampur. Uh, Bill Pullen in geology, uh, Len Breen in, uh, uh, sociology. in sociology, yeah, yeah. And uh, who was it, there was, there was one more. Uh, goodness. Uh, I'll, I'll think of it. I'll think of it. <laughs> okay. Mm. Yeah. We can add that in later. Yeah. But I, I'm going to get that in. Uh, oh, Derek Davenport, chemistry. Derek Davenport, chemistry. Uh, there may were have been more, were but they that's the ones I can think of. Two years as well? Pardon? Were two years as well? No, some of them. Generally, I, I think uh, were they generally like visiting, the maybe teaching for faculty were generally a year or a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, a year, well, year, nice. year and a half. Um, so those from Purdue. Also, um, the other, other uh, uh, universities sent faculty. There was also, it was a, it was a two-way street, too, because uh, faculty at IIT Kanpur would, would be coming to the United States. There weren't very many of them because uh, mo uh, nearly all the, at least the professorial staff level, uh, there were a lot of instructors who had uh, there who even had PhDs, but they, they didn't get above the level of instructor. They had PhDs from Indian uh, universities. But most of all, the assistant associate full professors had uh, doctoral degrees from, from the UK, Canada, or US. My, uh, institutions, and so they were already familiar with uh, with students and research and all. Uh, in in the libraries, uh, M. K. Kelkar, who was the deputy librarian at uh, at IIT Kanpur while I was there, they had not never selected, had not yet selected a, a a librarian, the head of the library. They they had the deputy librarian, and uh, he he came. M. K. Kelkar came for. Uh, for six months uh, at Purdue, to the, to the Purdue libraries, and, and had an opportunity to see how how we do okay. it here. Okay. Yeah. Well, you were in charge of you were in charge of the library. Three well, years. technically, we were not in charge. Okay. Uh, we we were merely ad advisors. Like an adjunct, perhaps. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I I equate it sometimes uh, to like Vietnam. We went as advisors, but we ended up fighting the war because. Uh, mo uh, Practically every uh, teaching faculty member who went taught courses. Uh, one of them was even acting head of a, a department while it was being established, and uh, mm -hmm. so we we went as advisors, but we ended up fighting the war. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that brings you back to after the two years. What next? Did you want to talk about the math library, or what? What, did you, uh, what post okay. did you get when you got back? Pardon? What post did you have when you came? Oh, back? Oh, when I came back, I was uh, still an engineering librarian. And uh, uh, even though they advertised it, it hadn't been built. Oh no, no, that was not until 1969. Yeah, I, I jumped ahead a little bit. There. Okay. Yeah, sure. that was not until 1969. Uh, so uh, 67, 66, I came back, and uh, I was told first thing when I got back, oh, you will be teaching a new uh, literature of engineering course. Uh, there, there had been a chemistry, chemical literature course taught by uh, M.G. Mellon for, for decades and all. And the nuclear engineering department uh, wanted to establish a, a uh, literature of engineering course to, for the graduate students and undergraduates if they wanted to take it to uh, get them familiar with that. So I had to organize from scratch. <laughs> a, 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 it was a one-hour credit course uh, taught, in, taught in nuclear engineering. And I had a kind of a, a joint appointment with, uh, with nuclear engineering. So if somebody asks me, oh, you were a librarian at, or you were at Purdue, did you teach anything? Uh, and I said, well, yeah, I taught a nuclear engineering course. <laughs> and <laughs> that if, oh, you're a nuclear engineer, <laughs> but no, but. I wear many hats. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I came back. And then uh, at that time, the 
uh, School of Science was just being formed. And uh, uh, that, uh, well, even before that, I had gotten the math library to be in charge of. But then the School, the school of Science was being formed. And uh, uh, so, so I had the math library and the geology library, which were in science. And then these other. In what other building were you located? Libraries. Uh, the math library. It was in a recitation hall. So the math uh, science building had not been built. The math science building was open in 19. It was under construction at the time I was in India. It opened in 67. Okay. We moved the library in 1967. Okay. Uh, so then I was appointed. Uh, yeah. So that then um, Ed Posey came as as engineering librarian, and I I was then working with, worked with, uh, uh, with geology and mathematical sciences library, and, uh, uh, and, and then some other things which we'll get into later here. Okay. Okay. And the library grew quite a bit, and the building um, was, was pretty good size for the math library, probably larger than what you had before. Mm -hmm. The, the new facility. The new oh, facility. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Sure. I think we had 2,500 square feet in the old facility, and the new one then had 8,000 square feet. And we did not shelve books on the top shelf or the bottom shelf. And uh, I remember when very small children came into the library, it was a great place to play because they could crawl in and out among the lower lower shelves of the library, something to, for the grad, grad students or the faculty to entertain their kids with when they were in the library. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun thing to do. <laughs> yeah, uh, and the math library, I, I want to say that yeah. the math library was, uh, which was one of the, the very best in the United States, uh, was developed by uh, uh, Aubrey Smith, who was a math professor. He was the library representative. And he started work, working here in 1938 and was put in charge of, of, of the of the library, it was not. It was a, a collection then at that time. It, I, it may not have been part of the library system, but they started collecting books and journals and all. And he continued working at at that job until I think he retired about 1982 or something like that. And uh, uh, he developed a, a absolutely wonderful collection uh, for the uh, for the for the mathematicians and and, and statistics people. Uh, to use, and it was recognized as one of the best. Uh, he was very good at getting money from the department. Uh, uh, sometimes they uh, they would double the amount of our book budget, uh, supplementing funds that, that they had available That's to them. Good. Well, you were fortunate over the years. It yeah, all paid off. Yeah, yeah. No, so the engineering library, some of those uh, uh, some some of those departments supplemented the funds too, but not many. Uh, in the uh, late in the late 60s 67 68 uh, the universe the library system as a whole uh, was not getting sufficiently funded and Moriarty thought okay if I turn the request for funding for books and journals over to the deans rather than my Moriarty's asking for it we may get more money and which he did and I think it proved, at least as far as the engineering libraries went, it proved successful only within the school, with the mechanical engineering library. We didn't get any less funds. We got a, 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 an increase, an average increase. But mechanical engineering evidently really fought, and they got their book budget doubled and all because of that. I think that, that lasted only two or three years. Moriarty saw it really wasn't, wasn't working. <laughs> Stop. You want to continue? You want to break it up? No, I'm fine. Okay. I'm fine. Okay. Then I think the next thing, talk a little about the directors. Moriarty was your director when he came. Yeah. But can we stop just a minute? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Moriarty, yeah, he, he came from the Library of Congress. And uh, as I understand it, uh, he was hired to develop a strong system of departmental libraries uh, with the, within the university. Uh, and, and he did. 
And uh, I think, well, I know some librarians uh, felt more allegiance to their department than they did to the did to the libraries. They felt they had uh, stronger relations with the department head than they had with the with the director of libraries. Uh, that was advantage or disadvantage as as you as you may look at it. Um, when I uh, when I came, I, I really felt quite intim intimidated by Mr. Moriarty until uh, after I returned from Kanpur, and then I lost that uh, 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 feeling. Uh, I, I would, I'd like to re just read this part here. Uh, he would come in each morning uh, through the loading dock door, uh, check the new books received in acquisitions, and go up to his office. In mid-afternoon, he would go through Stuart Center uh, to the lounge on the second floor of Stuart Center. Uh, he would join three or four librarians around a coffee table, and in a few minutes more would come in. Uh, the circle would grow and grow until maybe there might be as, as 12, uh, more 12 there, as many as 12 there. Uh, he'd talk about what was going on in the university and the libraries, uh, and I believe he uh, expected us to pass that information on to the staff members that we worked with. Uh, there were no staff meetings. Uh, when it came to management styles, he was a benign dictator. Uh, I think it worked very well during his tenure, uh, but it wouldn't work today. Uh, a complaint I heard in the uh, last 25 years in the libraries was that uh, directors and deans uh, don't get out of the office, their office uh, in Storch Center. And I don't remember uh, Mr. Moriarty ever coming to any of the engineering libraries uh, when I was in charge of them from 58 to 69. So I think this, uh, maybe it's a tradition within the, the, the office over there that you, you don't go out to the libraries very often. Uh, <coughs> uh, the door to his office uh, uh, before 1960 when he moved, when the Stuart Center, the old library area of Stuart Center was remodeled, uh, the door to his office was always, always open. Uh, it was in the area of what is now uh, Scott Brandt's office. Uh, Mr. M was known in the library for his uh, desk pounding and for his colorful language. Uh, lots of hells and dams, but uh, nothing obscene. Uh, he got the libraries um, involved in uh, important national projects. After World War II, it was found that the results uh, of some war research projects uh, that had been, had been published uh, in the open literature uh, of European literature but the uh, material was not available in the U.S. And this essentially meant that U.S. labs duplicated research that had already been done in Europe. Uh, so in order to avoid this happening in the future, uh, a group of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, librarians uh, met at Farmington, New Hampshire, and to establish what's known as the Farmington Plan, uh, which was a, a division of the collection subject areas uh, among uh, many libraries here within the United States. Uh, Purdue Libraries uh, was assigned physics, photography, and cookbooks. Uh, Rachel Rode, a Purdue Libraries cataloger, uh, provided full library, full library of Congress cat level cataloging uh, to the Library of Congress, and these records were entered into the National Union Catalog. Uh, I remember library staff looking at the cookbooks, especially the Scandinavians one, Scandinavian ones with beautiful colored photography and wanting to use uh, the recipes. But unfortunately for them, uh, the recipes were not in English. Uh, the original uh, point of collecting photography uh, was for scientific uh, value, uh, but a lot of art photography books uh, appeared, uh, especially uh, nudes. And Rachel was kind of reticent about publishing, about cataloging those. <laughs> um, Mr. M fought to get an addition to the general library to the north of the building uh, into what is now the, uh, the park uh, north of the building. And sketches of plans uh, do exist. Uh, finally, in the mid-1950s, uh, he got a call from a university administrator telling him that a conference uh, facility was being built on the site of Old Fowler Hall and the General Library Annex. Uh, and uh, they could make room for a library. 
um, within, within that. So the Memorial Center, now Storch Center, reading rooms uh, were open in the spring of 1958. Uh, there were three floors uh, with a divisional arrangement of subjects. Uh, language, literature, and fine arts on the first floor, science and technology on the second floor, and the remaining subjects uh, on the third floor. Uh, there were three reference desks. There were uh, four circulation desks, uh, one on each of the entrances from Stort Center hallway and one at the entrance to the west foyer beneath the mu uh, mural. Uh, these, of course, presented problems for circulation department of the libraries to staff all the time. And, uh, I, and we did lose a lot of books probably, and I remember Mr. M saying, they promised me a library and they gave me a goddamn sieve. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, that's, I don't know, question about Mr. Amber. Yeah, yeah. um, and then Mr. Dagnese was next, you worked under Dagnese? Yeah, yeah, I, were, I worked with Joe. Uh, I first met Joe in India, believe it or not. Um, he, uh, he came on a, uh, the Ford Foundation was uh, interested in a program at the Birla Institute of Technology in Palani in Western India. Uh, interesting project there, similar to what the USAID was doing, uh, developing the uh, IIT Kanpur. And Joe was a part of the team, the Ford Foundation team, although he was at MIT at the time, uh, came to survey what might be done for the libraries. And he did end up spending a year or two in India with his uh, with his family there, uh, so uh, okay, uh, yeah, the, he was. Uh, I think Joe was uh, uh, responsible for bringing us into the uh, electronic age uh, in the in the libraries, uh, uh, initiating uh, our entry into the use of OCLC for cataloging, and then developing our own li library system. I think it was called Pulse, if I remember right, and uh, that was uh, it was a, it was an online catalog, and it was in, available in many libraries. Uh, the only uh, uh, the only unit of it system uh, subsystem that developed was the online catalog, and then uh, there was a project. The state legislature uh, wanted the as I remember, one of the, the state universities to cooperate and all go into the to one system, and because uh, that would uh, because it would have taken a lot of money uh, to continue developing the Purdue system, and it would have been unique to Purdue only. Uh, it was decided to discontinue that, and Purdue then went to the notice system. I think all the I believe all the state universities of all state Indiana State. Uh, IU and Purdue all went to it at the same time and got and got funding uh, for it. Uh, so we we went uh, we went into that. So I think that was his his big big contribution. Uh, some years after he arrived, well he he reported when he arrived to the uh, uh, provost as the as the dean of libraries does now. But then there was a vice president for academic services. Uh, whose position was filled, the position was filled by Don Brown, uh, was put in between the libraries and the uh, uh, president. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think Joe felt kind of demoted by that. And uh, Don Brown would represent the libraries at meetings, library meetings, and really didn't have the knowledge that he needed to be, to be at these meetings where they were particularly dis discussing new electronic uh, products for the libraries. He just didn't have the knowledge that, that he, he represented the libraries and perhaps did not do as good a job. Yeah. And uh, Joe, I think, just became dejected by the whole thing and uh, may well have planned to retire early. <laughs> okay. One final thing then, Emily was the director when you retired. She came after Joe. Yeah, I, I knew she Emily from, uh, from Special Library Association. I'd known her for several years mm -hmm. beforehand. And uh, she, she continued bringing us on into the electronic age. And uh, it's known nationally uh, among librarians and publishers for uh, how to deal with uh, online 
uh, uh, online journals, online access to journals, and, and paying a reasonable fee for them. And also, her, her big contributions uh, were in, uh, in that. And also, she got a, uh, <coughs> uh, a, a development uh, area going for gift, gifts to the library. Going, I, I don't think there were any very much previous uh, Moriarty or Daniese worked at how they worked at all, if any, sure. uh, to develop a, uh, a, a uh, give, office of giving. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but of course, the university that. moved in that direction more than it used to be. Right. All right. So yeah. it was part and parcel on the strategic plan and things of that sort, too. Yeah. I think you're yeah. right on that. Um, how about professional association? You've been pretty involved in SLA all these, these years, haven't you? Yeah, I, uh, uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Moriarty and Esther Schlent, who was uh, the head of public services, uh, she, uh, uh, she, uh, both of them got me involved with Special Libraries Association, and uh, she suggested I attend the uh, 1962 uh, SLA conference in Washington, D.C., which I did, and then in 63 I went to uh, Denver uh, to the SLA conference, I then went to, uh, went to Concord, and then came back and started going to them again. And occasionally, and then in 1972, I became very involved with it. I, uh, I was, was uh, with nationally, but local at, lo on the Indiana chapter right. level. I served as treasurer and president of the chapter. And, and you got some awards from that well, too. Well, yeah, I ended up. Uh, I was very active in the uh, uh, physics, astronomy, and mathematics division, and uh, uh, was served very, a lot of committees and. Uh, treasurer and uh, uh, chairman of that uh, chapter, of that division of the association. I was slightly active in the uh, science technology division, and they asked me if I would run for chair of the division, and uh, I, I, I knew who was, I, well, I, I found out later who would be my opponent. I said yes, and then I found out who the other person was, and I said, oh, well, I'm just the sacrificial lamb. Uh, that's and that's okay with me, and lo and behold, I won. <laughs> mm. And I really didn't expect to. <coughs> but then I, I received the uh, 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 this Astronomy Math Achievement Award, mm -hmm. uh, which was for outstanding contributions to the division of, of uh, right. this Astronomy Math Division. And you also got the John H. Moriarty Excellence in Library Service, well, which yeah, brings yeah. me. Which brings me to giving well, back. Well, let me back up here. Okay. One, uh, thing. And then uh, uh, in uh, 2002, after I, in the spring of 2002, after I retired in 2001, uh, in January, I got a call from the president of SLA, and uh, during it was during the winter meeting of, of the of the uh, board and officers, uh, divisions and chapters and said, uh, you have been, have been elected to the SLA Hall of Fame, and I need to get your acceptance of it before I announce it publicly. And I said, what? <laughs> this is a joke. <laughs> I can't believe that I got this. And uh, uh, I, I, that, that was about the biggest surprise of my career, really, th nice. that I got that award. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, right. <laughs> I but really was, was never ex expected. Giving back the John H. Moriarty Award for Excellence in Library Service. Yeah. Would you make a comment on that? You have supported that. Yeah. Uh, it was not, I, I want you to know, and others know, that it was, it, the, the idea did not originate with me. Uh, the idea originated with Marge Sumstein, uh, who was the psychology education librarian at the time. I think it was the early, early 80s. Uh, and uh, we, decided that something should be done to honor Mr. M. He had been here for so many years. And so we decided to jointly fund an award, which I think was $500 at that time. And uh, uh, then she passed away four or five years later. And since then, I have funded it. And I also uh, endowed, uh, uh, gave the uh, fund is endowed for its continuation. Uh, at the time of uh, Joe Daniese's death, a memorial fund was set up, and uh, it was decided eventually that it would be used to give a, an award to the clerical service staff. And uh, they, a clerical service staff group 
decided there should be two awards rather than just one. And uh, uh, I guess at that time also the professional administrative group were added to it. So all, all the categories of library staff would be available. And it was so small that I thought really that, that ought to be enlarged. So I, I contributed money so that the total value of the two, fund, two awards there would be the same as the uh, uh, Moriarty Award. Then when Jim Mullins came, he felt they should all be the same. So I, I have continued to uh, supplement the Don Yese Awards. Question that I share having been here a long time. Why was the, the supporter never uh, relief? You know, people didn't know, and I share that because John, uh, John Hoppus got the first award. Yeah. And he told Joe that he wanted, he wanted to send an acknowledgement to the donor. Yeah. And Mr. And Joe said, no, that, that you cannot do that. And I talked to John, and he felt badly because John was a very outgoing person, yeah. Yeah. and we want to thank donors, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know why that would have, why he would have, uh, the, uh, he, Joe, Joe would have put it that way. He would have said, you know, yeah, I send me the letter and I will pass it on to the donor. I, I don't know. I don't know why he did. But, yeah, but we, I we heard did. that from John. I mean, yeah. that was John's, uh, yeah. because yeah. John was a very yeah. warm, oh, yeah. outgoing person, and yeah. he shared that with me, and so that's how I, that yeah. was coming from him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know why. Yeah. But I don't know, Marge, uh, and I, I think we just wanted to, very to be nice. anonymous, but to, to be known at some time. It's very and nice. it was announced at the time I retired. I know, and Emily, I think Emily that's an appropriate it. time to do it. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, there are others that got it in the meantime, and you're very comfortable with it. Yeah. But I think that now that, particularly I work on, I've been on the Earhart Scholarship Committee for a number <coughs> of years, and Judy is on that, and um, we do know the donor has been funded and everything, and we encourage the winners to send a note. I mean, we know who the donor is, and the, yeah. the donor likes to get those acknowledgments yeah. and sometimes gets to meet the students. Too. Yeah. The donor used to come for the awards but doesn't come anymore. Uh -huh. So I think that, and I think there's a, a trend within the university that the donors are acknowledged, and it's nice for the students, certainly in athletics, they have an affair, so they can meet them, those in the John Purdue Club, and I think it, it, it's meaningful, and it, it means, yeah. I know it means a lot to the people, both the student, the winner, and the one that is given. Yeah, that, yeah. Well, yeah. I, between you and me, and I, maybe this doesn't need to go into that. You can talk to me that afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just do closing. Any uh, uh, closing things? How about an outstanding event in your life? You got something you want to share? Oh, yeah, the, um, living in India. Uh, getting used to the culture, uh, knowing more about the culture, um, the uh, uh, the opportunity to travel all over India, uh, meeting many many friends that you kept in touch with. Yeah, you, yeah, not not so much anymore, but, but over, used over your to. career. Yeah, some of them are gone now. <laughs> right. yeah. I, I was I was only 30, 20, 20 Yeah, I saw, I I was thirty when I went there. <laughs> And many of them were much older. <laughs> and all, I, I, I saw uh, just recently that um, Arthur Burks, who was a uh, professor at Michigan, yeah, died. I read it in the New York Times. And uh, he was, I didn't realize at the time, but he is one of the most noted, absolutely most noted people in computer science. He worked on the ENIAC computer at the University of Pennsylvania. And, all, and I didn't realize at the time that. He was he was sure. important as he was. So right. the co the Confort project did draw lots of lots of important right. people. Tell me one other, one other thing, and then closing comments. Retirement activities since you've been retired. Oh, okay. Uh, well, the first thing I started out with just very shortly after I retired was uh, volunteering at the uh, Visitors Information Center in the uh, Union Building at Purdue. At Purdue, uh, yeah, at Purdue. And I, I must say, yesterday yesterday was the uh, first day of Boilermaker Gold Rush. And if, if every day every day I worked there were as busy as yesterday was, I would retire tomorrow. There were, there were 68 questions uh, within four hours, and so many of them had to do with the bus, city bus system, how do I get there from here? And I eventually had to say, you can't. <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, so I've, I've been doing that, and then uh, uh, also, uh, for the last three years, I've been volunteering at the uh, Indianapolis Museum of Art uh, at, uh, at Indianapolis uh, in the library, um, uh, processing new books, 
uh, greeting people at the front desk, um, checking, the, doing pre-order, bibliographic searching. Uh, right now I'm checking a 600-page uh, bibliography of art reference books. That's going to take a while. And uh, uh, also entering into a, uh, an access database, uh, a, the artists who have displayed uh, whose works have been displayed in IMA organized uh, exhibitions, and that's an ongoing project. I'm I'm now up to 1907, so <laughs> that's, yeah, that's that's going to take quite That'll a while. That'll be very nice to have. Yeah. Then also I've been uh, uh, volunteering, but working at home uh, for the Carroll County Historical Society Museum, uh, where I'm from, and all, and uh, uh, doing uh, uh, and entering. Uh, records primarily for genealogical searching. Uh, what I've done so far are the uh, uh, school uh, enrollment records for, 19, for 1897 and 1909, which involves the student's name, uh, the parents' names, the, their age, the school they attended, and the township that they were in. And also a list of graduates of schools, of schools in Carroll County from 1888 to 1902. So those, those things have been done. And right now I'm working on an inventory of graves in Hickory uh, Grove Cemetery, which is about 10 miles north of Delphi, uh, in which I say half the people buried there are relatives of mine. And the other half are, that I'm not related to are related to those I am related to. And I think there are about 500 or 600 graves in, in the cemetery. <laughs> Uh, any closing comments that you'd like to for the researchers? Well, you 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 ask P Purdue traditions. Yes. And although it's, it's it's not a it's not a Purdue tradition, but it, it has to do with Purdue. Okay. But it, it's a tradition of mine that I have managed to to keep ever since the first day I worked here. I have never been to a home football game in Rossade Stadium in all these years. I've had tickets offered, uh, even uh, uh, John Hicks offered me uh, tickets, and I'm sure they would have been good seats. But I have, I have just resisted in order to, to maintain uh, the, this tradition. And the other tradition, which lasted for several years, was a, a very one, good one to let off steam. Uh, there were several of us who would gather, uh, this would be the late 60s and 70s, at uh, Sarge Bilt's, in the, we had our table in the bar, and almost every Friday evening after work, uh, you would find us there, uh, letting go. And uh, uh, as as Las Vegas has what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas, what was said at that table in Sarge Bilt's stays at that table in Sarge Bilt's. <laughs> so it was a way of, of, did you know what so and so did? Oh my God! If we were running this library. <laughs> It would be much better. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Dick. Uh, I really appreciate that. You're it was welcome. Very nice.